Good afternoon. So good to see everybody here tonight. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we have some visitors among us. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're encouraged uh, by your presence, and we ask you to come back, uh, stick around with us after services, and we can talk to you uh, about the Word of God or about the worship service uh, this morning, or this afternoon, rather. I'm so thankful, again, for the opportunity to be able to speak uh, on this behalf. Uh, thankful for the elders for allowing uh, myself and for Nathan uh, to be engaged in the preacher training program. Uh, we're going to be able to speak on Sunday nights uh, near the end of the month. And so I'm thankful for that opportunity. Uh, if you notice, Krista and I, we have not been here on Sunday mornings uh, pretty much for the whole year. Uh, I've been uh, helping a church, uh, Black Creek Church of Christ, uh, on Sunday mornings. And I'm here to tell you that this, uh, at the end of the summer, I'll be going full-time preaching there. Uh, it's uh, something exciting, but also something maybe sad that we will not be with you near the end of the summer. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to grow, uh, to get into uh, the gospel, to work with the church, and, and we're excited about that. I'm so thankful for the training here, uh, here at Gardendale and so thankful for the encouragement that you've given to us. So thank you so much uh, for all of that. Have you ever stood out among a, a different crowd? Or maybe that you're walking a certain way at work, that you're standing out for your faith as a Christian. And the people around you are acting different. Uh, a lot of times we may think about sports. Uh, me and Jared, we, we love football. And there was one time where we wanted to go watch a game at Athens, Georgia. That we wanted to wa watch our team play the Georgia Bulldogs. And if you've ever gone to a, an away game, you know you're outnumbered about, what, 100 to 1? And as we're at that game, and we realize that there are people that they don't like the colors we're wearing. And if you're a Georgia fan, I'm sorry, but... Y'all nasty. Y'all mean. I mean, we had grown men wanting to kill us because of the colors of the team that we were wearing. And as we get to our seats, we realize, you know, we're going to cheer as loud and as hard as we can. And when our team scored the first touchdown, you know, we're doing our battle cry and, and there's people around us. And why do they always put you around the other team? You know, it seems like there's always going to be a, an argument going on. You know, we were standing out among a different culture there. And when our team scored, we're, we're giving, it, giving it back to them. They're giving it back to us. But as the time starts going down on the clock, we realize our team is about to lose. And we start to try to get as small as possible. We want to put our jacket back on so they don't see our colors. And we want to start to fit in with the culture around us. You know, we read about a church uh, in Revelation chapter 2 where Jesus commends them for their faith for standing out for their belief in Jesus. But we realize that there are a couple things that culture is starting to influence them on. That they're starting to fall back off this slippery slope to try to stand in with the culture. And that's the church at Pergamos. So are you there with me in Revelation chapter 2? Revelation chapter 2. We're talking about spiritual compromise. Have you ever had to compromise something? Uh, in regards to spiritual compromise, uh, compromising the Word of God, we're going to examine uh, this afternoon, is it okay for us to have a spiritual compromise on the Word of God? In Revelation chapter 2, looking at verse 12, here Jesus writes, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now if we're familiar with Revelation, these first couple of chapters, here, John the Apostle, he's exiled to the island of Patmos. Uh, Jesus reveals the revelation to write to these seven churches of Asia. And he's, as he's writing this to them, it's very similar to these seven letters, to these seven churches. Jesus addresses himself. Uh, Jesus is going to give them a, a final uh, valediction there in, in verse 17 about he who has an ear, let him hear. And here he addresses himself as the sharp two-edged sword. In Revelation chapter 1, uh, it's this same idea, Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. He says, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. What we know about the city of Pergamos is that it was a, a Roman province, uh, one of the first Roman provinces given to this area. And what we know about a sword is that a sword, that indicates power. That indicates authority. Because in this time and age, if you had the most swords, you probably had the most power. And so they would understand that. But Jesus has given these Christians the encouragement that He has the sword, a, a two-edged sword that is able to cut not only the flesh, but it can cut the Spirit. Do you remember what it said in Hebrews 
Hebrews chapter 4, where it says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Can we stop right there and say amen? That the Word of God is alive, it is active, and it is ever-present in our day and life. That this isn't just some book that we read about, but it's the instructions of what Jesus has given to us. It's the instructions that are able to transform our life. You know, that's what Andrew and Jason have been preaching about in their lessons. That this Word of God, it can transform us. And Jesus is telling these Christians here in Pergamos that He has this sharp two-edged sword. You know, it said that this sword is coming out of His mouth. What, does, what do you think that indicates? You know, that indicates that His teachings are what give the instruction. You know, I think about John chapter 12, verse 48. Jesus said, The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You know, the very teachings of Christ and what he gives to his apostles, that has authority. There is power in that. And I think we can see that here in Pergamos. Looking at verse 13, he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. A couple of culture history about Pergamos, you know, it was a city known for its idol worship. Uh, if you go there today, you'll see ancient ruins uh, of the temples that they had to their gods, uh, all kinds of Roman gods there. And the city sat up about a thousand feet on a hillside. And below you could see the countryside. And did you notice that Jesus describes that this is a place where Satan's throne dwells? You know, in other words, Jesus is saying, listen, I know where you are. You're in amongst an evil generation where there's cult worship, there's sexual immorality, there's people sacrificing to idols. And Jesus says, listen, I see where you're at. I know the situation that you are in. And what we understand from Pergamos is that there was a lot of idolatry, a lot of sexual immorality going on. But here we have a church, people that are called to be Christians, performing their faith, meeting together to worship the Lord. And as he says here in our text, and you hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So they have one of their very own. He was martyred. He was killed for the faith in Jesus. You know, sometimes I think that if I am a faithful Christian, I'm going to be rewarded. That I'm doing these good things, not maybe to earn my salvation, but I generally may expect that if I do good, God will provide for me. But we see that this man, he was keeping his faith among an evil generation, but he was killed for it. And so what we understand from Scripture, that God is with us, but we see that he was not going to compromise his faith. And so Jesus is commending this church here. You know, when I think about uh, compromise, uh, sometimes I'll do the laundry and I'll be looking around for my reward. You know, Krista does a lot of that and I'll be like, where's my reward at? When we think about the Christians here, that they're being faithful and Jesus is commending them for their faith. When we think about us in our day and age and we think about Satan's throne is here and God has given him certain power to go in this world. In 1 John chapter 5, uh, the scripture says, We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. God has allowed Satan to have some type of power here on this earth. And as Paul tells us that we shouldn't be ignorant of his devices, that he has certain devices that will lead us astray, that it will blind us to the truth of God's Word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Paul telling the Corinthians, uh, talking about uh, the God of this age, that he has blinded uh, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. You know, in the Garden of Eden, didn't Satan, he blinded Eve? from the truth of what Jesus said. He tried to change what the Word of God was. And I think we see here that these Christians of Pergamos, they've been faithful uh, among an evil generation, and Satan is going to use some devices to try to twist them to that. And you know, that's what we see right here in verse 14. He says, But I have a few things against you. You know, Jesus has commended them, but He's saying, listen, there are a couple things that we need to get in line. He says here in verse 14, Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So there are two things that he has against these Christians here. 
And remember, they've been faithful. And this is a difficult situation that they are in. And Jesus is saying, listen, I haven't forgotten where you're at. You are among evil people and you've been faithful. But I still have a couple things against you that are against my word of what he's taught. Uh, do you remember they're talking about this doctrine of Balaam? Uh, do you remember in Numbers chapter 23 and 24 and 25, the Israelites, they're going uh, to the promised land and they conquer Og, they conquered Sion, and they get to the land of Moab. And King Balak of the Moabites, he's afraid, isn't he? And so he's going to get this sorcerer, Balaam, to try to curse the Israelites. And we see that it's not going to work because Balaam, you know, he's realizing, listen, I can only speak what God speaks. And instead of cursings, he gives them blessings. And so King Balak tries to up the ante, starts to give him some more money to try to influence him. And it works for a little bit. Uh, You know, that's the story where uh, Balaam gets on the donkey and the donkey speaks to him and he sees the messenger, the angel of the Lord in front of him and tries to turn his way. But we see that in this doctrine of the Balaamites, it's where Balaam got the Israelites to compromise their faith. Because Balaam, you know, he couldn't curse the Israelites. But he realized, you know what? I could probably get the Israelites to curse themselves because they serve a jealous God, a God that would not have them compromise His truth. And in Numbers uh, chapter 25, you know, we see that when you choose culture over calling, it causes us to compromise. The Israelites decided to compromise the Word of God of which He gave them. And here I have this calling. Uh, It's not some kind of calling or or a feeling that you get, but it's the calling of what Jesus calls us to. He calls us to obey His Word. And we can get that instruction from there. And in Numbers chapter 25, this is where now the Israelites remained in Osseo Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate. They bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined with Baal of Peor. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. You know, Balaam knew if he could counsel the people of Moab, he could get those Israelites to fall away after their own idols. And we see that in Numbers 31. Uh, This is where a plague, it just broke out because they're committing all this harlotry. And God says, every one of them deserves to die. And in Numbers 31 verse 15, Moses said to them, Have you kept all the women alive? He said, they were ordered to destroy all those Midianites that were committing this harlotry. And he says, look, you know, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Balaam got those Israelites to compromise the God of Israel, the, the one that gave them the instruction. And they started falling off, you know, this slippery slope that we see here. What we understand from biblical stories is that God will not accept compromise of sin. He's not going to lead us to follow into sin because He has given us everything we need to follow after Him. You know, this idea of compromise, it's not necessarily bad in and of itself. We understand that there are certain areas where we do need to compromise. Uh, One could be marriage. I learned that really fast. Uh, One of our first arguments Chris and I have it was really silly. We were making this pizza on a Friday night to try to make a pizza. We got all kinds of toppings. And I didn't realize pineapple goes on pizza. You know, she loves it. It's as sweet. It's good. You know, I can put pepperoni, sausage, chicken, meat, you know, meat lovers. That's great. But we had to compromise to decide what was going to go on there. And we think about business. You know, there are certain areas in business we have to compromise, especially there in our marriage and in businesses. You know, what about here as a church? There are certain compromises an eldership has to make. But what we see a biblical principle is that we don't compromise biblical principles. We can compromise preferences. Uh, An example is, you know, we're not going to compromise the Lord's Supper. We understand Scripture tells us to partake in the Lord's Supper, uh, the emblems of the bread uh, and the cup. But what about the preference of passing it out? You know, we're going to pass it out in little cups. Are we going to pass it out, you know, on a tray? What we see in Scripture is that there are certain principles that we need to follow, and we cannot compromise the biblical truths that we see. You know, a definition of compromise in regards to the Christians here in Pergamos is that they were allowing culture to influence their calling. And remember, he says he knows the difficult situation that they are in. 
And I think Jesus too, He knows the situation we're living in. And what an admonition for us that we can get from this story is that Jesus sees us. He sees the situation. Uh, he sees us maybe the, the bad marriage we may be in. He may be seeing our children that are not faithful. But He is calling us to be faithful to Him. You know, even if we're going to suffer for it, He does not want us to compromise a biblical truth that He gave. And here, these Christians, they were compromising that. They were going back to sexual immorality. And remember, some of these Christians were probably coming from these pagan practices. And, and here, they are, here they are claiming that they are practicing this. And, and a result of this compromise, they're saying, you know, you claim a faith that you aren't practicing. They want to claim the name of Christian, but they still want to go to the idol worship and practice in that. You know, they may have come from, you know, that sexual immorality practices, but they want to wear the name Christian, but they're going to say, Lord, it's, it's okay, this, this temptation I used to have. Can I not satisfy that? And when we think about compromise, God does not allow that. We see He doesn't want just part of us. He wants all of us. And so we do not compromise, you know, big things, or, or small things, big things rather, but we compromise smaller things. You know, it's just the little things that we're going to start to compromise. But what we understand, when we start compromising small things, doesn't that lead to major changes? You know, the Scripture talks about a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You put just a little bit of yeast in that loaf, and it's going to rise. And we think about uh, the Corinthian church, that if they start allowing sexual immorality to go on, all kinds of problems are going to happen. And we think about sin, how God must deal with sin, and it should not go unscathed. And here in Pergamos, there were some that were holding this doctrine. You know, those that were just allowing it to happen, aren't they not just as guilty? Here talking about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You know, we see that if we are not participating in it, but if we're letting it go and just, you know, tolerating that, we're just as guilty. Because how else are they supposed to come back to the Lord if we don't come to them in love and show them the truth of what God's Word says? Because remember, who has the sharp two-edged sword? That's Jesus. He has that sword coming out of His mouth that is able to kill the soul and the spirit. And He wants them to listen up. And that is an admonition for us uh, this afternoon. And so, what is the area of our faith that we're compromising? You know, is there just a small area that we're holding back from God? We want the name Christian, but, you know, I still like watching, you know, rated R movies with all kind of language, all kind of nudity. Have you ever met the man who says, I can handle that? You know, those movies that got all kind of nudity in it, foul language, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. You know, I don't know of a straight man where that has not affected them, affected their mind, where they said they can handle that. And I don't think we can have that type of mindset because we think about in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it talks about, shall we go on to sin so that grace may abound? And Paul's response, certainly not. You know, in other words, I can sin and ask for forgiveness later. You know, I used to have that mindset that if there was something that me and Jared wanted to do, but we knew Dad, he, he probably was going to say no. So we're like, well, we can probably take a butt whooping afterward. And so we can just kind of deal with this. And we can ask for forgiveness later. You know, that is a misconception of the word grace. Because grace has not given us the license to sin. It has given us the license to be freed from sin. It's what God is going to do to change us. He wants us to be loving towards Him and to be accepting of His Word. And when we think about these small areas that, that it may be in your marriage, it may be at your work. I know for my work, I have to submit uh, my timesheet. You know, are 40 hours, did I really work that 40 hours? Can I really charge that? You know, is that my integrity? Nobody else is going to know those things. But God wants everything. You know, I'm sure these Christians here, they thought hanging out by the idol worship, you know, it's no big deal. You know, this is the life I used to be, this temptation I used to have. It's not a big deal. But what we understand from Scripture, that sin is a big deal to God. That just a small sin is just as equal as one of the greatest sins that we see in Scripture. That a murderer can be considered the same as somebody that tells a, a little white lie. Because God deals with sin. And we cannot compromise the little sins in our life to try to justify ourselves. Because Jesus calls us to be a light. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, He says, you are the light of the world. 
A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your God, your Father in heaven. You know, Jesus has called us to something better. He has called us to something better than sin, better than sexual immorality, better than sacrificing to idols. But what about the idols of our heart? You know, is it college football? Do I put more time into that? And and I want to be so excited about that. Or am I more excited for the Word of God that I can let my Christian example be a light into this community? And I believe that's what God is calling us. That is what Jesus is calling us to. A problem that the Christians had here is that they were being tolerant of sin. That they didn't think it was a big deal to God. But it most certainly was. As we read further into our text, in verse 15, he says, Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. You know, to the church at Ephesus, uh, it was a little different. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You know, whatever this doctrine was, we can understand God hated it. And the church at Ephesus, they were staying away from it. But here in Pergamos, they were holding that doctrine. And this was something that the Lord hates. You know, how important is us to know what it is that the Lord hates? You know, that, that goes back to Bible study. That goes back to transformation of knowing what does this sword say? How can I defend myself against the, the doctrine of the devil? We need to know the Word of God. And, and we think about in verse 16, talking about repentance. In verse 16, it says, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You know, we talk about repentance a lot for new converts. People that are living a life of sin, they obey the gospel, and they want to repent and change. But here, talking about Christians, this is the idea that it is a constant cycle of repentance. That when we start reading the Scripture, and we start finding out what is it about my life that doesn't line up with the Word of God, I need to start repenting. And I need to start changing, going back to what the Word of God said. You know, David wrote Psalm 139. You know, a man after God's own heart. But David was a sinful man. He had a lot of sins in his life. But we see he had the type of contrite spirit God wants us to have. And he would say, you know, here in verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I heard a preacher one time say, you know, if you pray that prayer, you get ready for change. If you're being honest to yourself and you're truly asking God to serve, is there an evil bone in my body? Is there something that I'm lacking in my faith that is going contrary to your word? And God, cast that out of me. And if we're honest with ourselves, there can be real change if we're following the word of God. And so I encourage you to pray that prayer and be ready for God to work through his word in your life. In verse 16, he says, I am coming against you with the sword of my mouth. You know, that goes back to John 12, verse 48 that I read, that we're going to be judged by this sword that Jesus gives. And Jesus tells us he's coming back as the Savior of the world. But then what's going to judge us? It's going to be his very word that he has given, that God gave him this work to do on earth, and that he gave it to his holy uh, prophets and apostles to give to us, to write it down for us. And we are given that instruction on how we can conduct ourselves. And He's going to come against us with this Word. And I would hate on the day of judgment that we stand before a holy and righteous God and we say we didn't know. Because that would not be our our excuse. And that's not the excuse these Christians can have. Because He's going to use His Word to judge them there. Looking further in our text, in verse 17, He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name, which is written, which no one knows except him who receives it. You know, Jesus ends these seven letters very similar, where he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. You know, in other words, you know, everybody's got an ear, but not everybody listens. You know, Krista can repeat something to me, and I'm looking at my phone, and I can repeat exactly what she said. And what she'll do sometimes, she'll just make something up to see if I'm paying and understanding what she's saying. You know, this also could say, he who has a hearing device 
doesn't always hear at the right frequency. You know, the, the admonition is pay attention. Listen to these words that I'm giving to you. And he gives them two things here. Uh, the first is this hidden manna. You know, hidden manna, you know, what's he talking about here? When we read Revelation, I think we need to have an understanding of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, you know, God rained down manna for the Israelites when they're there in the wilderness. And then He commanded Moses to take the manna to put it in the Ark of the Testimony as it was hidden there. And we think about how Jesus taught that He's the bread of life, that Christians are supposed to feed upon Him, feed upon His Word, have a a hunger of righteousness for Him. And I see this as a a spiritual reward, that if they're going to be an overcomer, as Revelation talks about, to Him who overcomes, to Him who is enduring this persecution. And Jesus is saying, listen, I know where you're at. You're among an evil generation. And the admonition for us here at Gardendale, we too are among an evil generation where there's not a lot of people following after the teaching of Jesus. You know, there's a lot of churches here, but there's not a lot of churches that are going to follow the truth of the gospel. And Jesus sees us there. And He's going to tell us to be an overcomer. And this hidden manna, you know, this spiritual reward that we have in heaven, He's telling them to look forward to that. And secondly, he says, this white stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now, I was reading some history about this white stone, and, and some could say you were given a white stone and, and a name was written on it if you were needed to get into a certain event. But I, I really was kind of skeptical about that, don't know much about it. But talking about this new name, doesn't Jesus give us a new name when we become a Christian? that maybe it's different, that we've been living a life of sin, but when we obey His gospel, He can give us a new name. You know, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, what were they called there in Antioch? They were first called Christians, that they were disciples of Jesus. And when we read the Old Testament, were there not a lot of name changes? Abram turned to Abraham. Uh, Jacob uh, turned to Israel. Saul turned to Paul. Because Saul was, you know, he was standing there having Christians hunted down for their faith. Well, you know, you may be living a life of sin or you may be in sin now. Do you know Jesus can give you a new name? You know, it can be a a new way of living. That can be the new name He has given you. You know, if you have not obeyed the gospel, He is calling for you to obey Him because He's coming one day in righteousness to take vengeance on those who do not know His gospel and have not obeyed that. And He's coming because we are guilty of sin, that we've trespassed Him and He is wanting us to repent. You know, the Scripture says that God commands all men everywhere to come to repentance. Not that anybody should perish, but that all should have everlasting life in His name. Our challenge this evening is not to compromise biblical truths of what these Christians were doing here. And he says that if you're an overcomer, you can have life. That if you overcome these type of doctrines, these false teachings, you can have life. And this new name, I want to encourage you, if you have not obeyed the gospel, you can do that this very night. You know, there are some in our audience that need to respond to Jesus. That uh, you've been waiting for, I don't know what it is you're waiting for, but I don't know of a better time to submit to Jesus Christ than tonight. You know, if maybe there's something in your life that that you're sinful about, that that you're being compromising your faith, that you're wanting to wear the name Christian, but you're not letting go the sins of the world, that instead of standing out for your faith, you're wanting to stand in with the culture. And I tell you, brother, sister, I'm right there with you. You know, uh, you know, we think about the high school, you know, Corbin, Samuel, when I mean, you go into the school, you may be the only Christians there in your classes. And we think about all of us, you know, we need to stand out for our faith to be that light in this community. And so the encouragement for us tonight is to be a light, not to compromise our faith in Jesus. Uh, we have the song of invitation. If you're subject to, G- to Jesus, would you come forward tonight as we stand and as our brother leads us in song? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are made of.